Welcome, allies to the Visionary Activist Show, and I'm your weaver of context, Caroline Casey. So, yes, we are in Pledge Drive. I'm back here uh, on the East Coast, just outside, actually right now, inside Mordor, where, of course, even now we are inching the ring of power into the crack of doom. Our guest today, whom I will be bringing in very shortly, but many people have asked me to have Derek Jensen on the air, and today we do. And even though it's a premium fun drive, we want to do a really proper deep delving show. So uh, the third premium will be his latest book, which is Strangely Like War, just coming out about deforestation. And as many people have asked for Derek to be on the air, no, biting, incisive, powerful, deep critique that leads us to a deep place of grief, which is a nutrient compost that we need now. So it is more than perfect, again, that our guest today is Derek Jensen. Um, and uh, many of you know Derek. Again, I've, I've asked for him to be on. He is a deep delving philosopher, writer, teacher in prisons, activist, uh, ally, uh, keeper of, of deep delving exploring for, for all of us. And, uh, so welcome, Derek. Derek? for having me oh good wonderful i'm glad you're there and as i mentioned to you you know sort of backstage too that two weeks ago we had ed tick on working with vets and he said that the vets from vietnam one of whom said for all of them we have a viciousness in this country and we've been hired to be it by the collective um and we want you know how do we heal and and ed's been calling about you know eating our shadow publicly how do we begin to do that and you know as i as i read the culture of make believe which is the book i have of yours i go well you're sort of devoted to that aren't you um yeah but it's 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 a pretty hard thing you know even i and i guess in a lot of ways you know sort of my you know I've heard it said that for most people, a couple, three questions drive their life, and and for most of us, those questions begin pretty early. And for me, I guess one of the the fundamental questions I was asking as a child is: my father is extremely violent, and my brother has epilepsy from blows to the head, and he, my he broke my sister's arm, my my he raped my mother, my sister, and me. And I was asking as a child if, if his behavior isn't making him happy, why is he doing it? I, I couldn't understand that. And, and really, in many ways, you know, it's transmogrified. I mean, I, I'm not asking about my father anymore. He's, he's well out of my life, but, but the, the question can easily go to the, to the sort of larger scale of, you know, if the destruction of the natural world isn't making us happy, why are, why are we doing it? And, you know, we can take this to whatever level we want, you know, tr- destruction of individual psyches, destruction of, you know, one quarter of all women are raped in their lifetime. Another one fifth of them have to fend off rape attempts. And all the women I know say those figures are really low. I mean, what would cause people to do this? What what drives them to do it? And and that I mean, those are really some of the questions that drive a lot of my life. Trying to understand, trying to um, make. I mean, Judith Herman, who wrote the book. Um, Trauma and Recovery, which is which is an amazing book about post traumatic stress disorder. One of the things she talks about in there is the importance of of making meaning out of one's trauma. That that's one of the ways to provide at least symptomatic relief. And one of the ways that that one of the ways that we can view, and this is a bit teleological, but one of the ways we can view a lot of symptoms that people who have been traumatized when they when they are then acting out that that violence um, you can view that as an attempt to, to retell that trauma story and how much better it is if you can attempt to make meaning out of it and to speak it verbally instead of enacting it onto other people um, which is which is of course one of the problems with our culture is that we've attempted or they've attempted whoever's attempted to separate sort of separate soul from body separate the spiritual from the physical and so there's this this misunderstanding this belief that well here i'll tell a quick story that that i asked luis rodriguez several years ago why he's, he wrote gang guys in la la vida loca a wonderful book he's a he's a former gang member who got out through the literature of revolution and i asked him why so many gang kids stand on street corners shooting at mirror images of themselves you know, if they've got all this anger, you know, why don't they shoot at the capitalists, whatever? And his answer was great, which is, well, part of the answer is, of course, that cops pit them against each other. But another part of the answer was that 
these kids are shooting a mirror image of themselves because they want to die. And why do they want to die? They want to die because they're teenagers. And as a teenager, you're supposed to want to die. <laughs> but nobody has told these kids that that death can be metaphorical and spiritual. Yeah. And so they enact it in the physical world. And that's, that's something that I've become pretty convinced of on a larger scale is that, is that this, this, everybody knows that this way of life is so wretched and so out of control. And we want it to stop, but we don't understand that this transformation can be spiritual and metaphorical. And so they make 14 and a half or 13 and a half quadrillion lethal doses of plutonium-239. You know, this, this, this death urge gets manifested in the real world when if, you know, if there was any sort of intelligence working at all here, they would, they would recognize that by eating this shadow, they, they would simply become transformed. Yeah, I think I think that's crucial. That we we one of the things that we say is you know what whatever you know it says create theater or live melodrama. And again, you're talking about it on a, on a deeper level. But absolutely, we live in the only very recent 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 blip of culture where there is no initiation. One of the fra ways we've been telling a kind of frame story on the show is that one way of many to tell the story of now is the issue of the uninitiated Mars or the uninitiated male, and that. All pre-industrial cultures, all indigenous people would take, take particular loving attention to initiate teenagers. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that. We have the opposite again. You know, get lost. We hate our jobs. You will too. Rather than we, <laughs> rather than we need you. You know, we need you to build Stonehenge and to save the world and to plant trees. We need you. And it's true. In reading your book, you know, I'm reminded also, um, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out who the culture hates more, but it does certainly hate children. Uh, and the, the, I, I like to call it the reality police. And, and I think the crucial function of what you're doing too is, you know, there's a narcolepsy about just waking up, going, oh, oh, and see, and seeing the connections going, oh, oh. And, and again, the, I guess it's really, you know, what a culture would do with its teenagers is also, you know, to take the word cool back to its original derivation. It comes from kula kula in, in, uh, Yoruba. And it meant completely responsible. It, it meant somebody who was just on it. Just a cool passage of drumming was just the drummer and the divine. Nothing, no overplaying, nothing extra. A cool guy was somebody who took care of kids and was responsible. You know, and, and that's what initiation would be. This is what's cool. And we've lost that, you know. And, and I think that that's also what you're aspiring to do to get back to that. These broken treaties, and maybe we can dive into broken treaties that, that make us crazy and make us do crazy, painful things. Um, Broken treaties all over the place. Broken treaties with teenagers. Broken treaties with animals. Broken treaties with creation and, and well, oil. It's, it's the it's the classic, um, and we're sold we're sold a bill of goods all down the line that you know there's supposed to be this technotopia that we're going you know Christianity promises this heaven if you're only good enough and it's like gosh who de who decides who's you know who's good what what does good mean good means in this case having internalized the oppressor and um, Christianity provides that particular false contract. Science provides the false contract of a technotopia heaven. And, um, you know, what's the, what's the bill of goods that kids are sold? You know, you go to school, you go through this awful, horrid experience of 12 years sitting and waiting, sitting and praying for it to get over because afterwards you're supposed to get a, a great job, but then you sit and pray that, that that gets over until you're 65 and you retire. And it's, it's like, whose life is this? And um, and I think a lot about a line by Red Cloud, who said one of the best things I've ever heard anybody say, which is talking about the whites. Um, they made as many promises, more than I can remember, and they only kept but one. They promised to take our land, and they did it. And I think about that in terms of the sort of insatiability that comes with um, this, that comes with abuse that comes, uh, abusers are insatiable. There is no way that you can be good enough, that you can be perfect enough to stop them from abusing you. And what happens in that process is by trying to become perfect enough, you switch the focus from their outrageous behavior, which is where it should be, onto yourself. And that happens, and so we internalize responsibility. If something happens to you, it's bec because you... Um, you know, you didn't wash the dishes clean enough. You didn't, you parked the car in the wrong place, whatever. And it's the same with, um, American Indians. It's the same, you see that with, with, you know, U.S. foreign policy. You see, you see it with the, um, the Nazis. I mean, it's a classic, classic device used by those, both by the, the, the ones who want to exert this sort of 
um, atrocious power and also those who then perceive themselves as powerless. It's, 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 a, it's a way that we all participate in this particular game by all pretending that, that their promises make sense and that, you know, if, if we, the so-called powerless, can just, you know, if you just vote right, if you just, um, you know, be a green consumer, if you just do all this, frankly, trivial stuff, <laughs> then, then somehow outcomes will be different. And that actually leads to another thing I think is really, really important, which is one of the reasons that my mother stayed with my father was because there weren't bad women shelters in the 50s and 60s. But another reason was because of the false hope that he would change. And false hopes really blind us to unlivable situations. They blind us to real possibilities. You know, does, does, does anybody really think that warehouses are going to stop deforesting because we ask nicely or that Monsanto will stop Monsantoing because we ask nicely? And, or that, you know, Democrats are fundamentally different than Republicans. I mean, those are, those are all these false hopes that, that once again keep us firmly within the system.